I'm very lucky to have another uh, old and great friend of mine, Trevor Kaufman, on to join me. Uh, Trevor is someone I've admired for a really, really long time. Uh, he and I met when we both had our agencies back in the day. I had my old agency, iChameleon, and he had his uh, agency, Schematic, of which he was the, the co-founder. Um, he, I had a chance to go kind of pitch him on on uh, using iChameleon as, as a partner for Schematic. Uh, and I'm not convinced we ever actually ended up doing business together, but we, we, at the end of that meeting, we're like, you're cool. We should have dinner. And we ended up having dinner that night and becoming uh, friends for now a very long time. Uh, I, you know, beyond being a f f smart and uh, fun guy that I enjoy being around, he's also an incredibly uh, intelligent and inspirational leader. Uh, he, beyond being the CEO of uh, Schematic, which got acquired by WPP, he went on to being the CEO of Possible Worldwide, and then uh, is now most recently the CEO of Piano. Now, if you haven't heard of Piano before, uh, I don't know if that's as important as knowing that I would almost guarantee that you have run into their tech at some point. What Piano is, is a, a, like a unified technology platform that helps brands create personalized experiences across their sites and apps. Now that sounds like a lot to take in, but Trevor will definitely help explain that in more detail. Uh, but you've seen their tech across companies like TechCrunch or BBC or ABC and even LinkedIn uh, and probably not even known it. And so what Trevor and I are going to talk about today is uh, the economics around a prevalent human behavior that I have to be super passionate about, which is reading digital articles. I'm a crazy news junkie. I know Trevor is too, but he's taken it from being a passion to being a whole career. So he's going to talk a little bit about the business uh, and, and talk, talk about some of the trends he's seeing in the industry. And then we're going to pick his brain on what it takes uh, to be an entrepreneur and a leader in this space. So with that, here we go with another week of OSHIP. Oh, Trevor, welcome to OSHIP. I'm glad you're here. Hi, Freddie. Thanks for having me. I, I have to comment uh, that it either looks like the world's most soundproof room or you may be calling in from an insane asylum today. Yeah, it's it looks a little bit like a log cabin, but it's it's actually <laughs> padded. Yeah, they um they lock me in here periodically. If I uh, <laughs> if I get a little too excited, uh, they, they put me in here and, and yeah, based so on the question they're, they're they're ranting ravings of a CEO. They're like he thinks he's the CEO of the company again, yeah. best to lock him up in the room. Exactly, smart. exactly. The impersonating an executive, they put me in this room. Yeah. But there's internet access, so here we yeah, go. Yeah, good. That's good. I like and great sound quality, which is a win for a <laughs> ship. So, so I love that. You know, you know Trevor, uh, obviously, you know, you heard the intro. I'm a, I've always been a, both a friend and a fan of yours. Um, I, you know, I think Piano uh, is a very interesting company. I, I, I didn't want to steal too much of your thunder by setting it up in, in, the, uh, in the intro, uh, but it would be great if you could just give our audience a little bit more context around uh, what your business is and, and what you do. Sure. And, and Freddie, thanks so much for the uh, extravagant praise in the in your <laughs> It's true, man. It's sincere. Uh, um, so, so, uh, so and, and you, you really hit it right on the head. I mean, fundamentally, what Piano is about is under, is analytics and activation. Right, understanding online behavior with a web analytics and app analytics platform, and then using that data to customize your experience. So in the case of digital publishing, which is our primary vertical, um, you'll encounter Piano when it says, you know, we'll, we'll customize the articles that you're looking at. We'll say, please turn off your ad blocker. We'll say, um, you know, time to register, we'll ask you for data, we will tell you it's time to pay, we'll try to upgrade you or get you to share things uh, with friends. So it's it's all of those uh, conditional experiences that you have on a website are driven by piano. Um, and of course, all the data that that throws off from transactions, from content that you read, all your interactions on that site, uh, and we report on that back to our clients. So the clients are, as you mentioned, people like, uh, uh, BBC or an Axel Springer or a Vice or, you know, mm. as, as you will. And, and so I guess the thinking is, 
you let them be great at making great content. And then you, the idea is that they would outsource, you leverage your tech effectively to do all this stuff that they may not naturally have the tech and, and capabilities. Yeah. It's, to it's all the commercial layer on top of content. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we, we, when I kind of encountered the media business, I like a lot of other people thought there's got to be some new business model for content online. Mm -hmm. And, and what I noticed pretty quickly was that it wasn't, it wasn't a widget problem. There wasn't a, a fact that there was the, the there wasn't some new model. The problem was that the fundamental plumbing of the media business on the internet needed a lot of help. Clients mm. were stringing together lots of different pieces. One thing for identity management, another thing for A/B testing, another thing for subscription commerce, another thing for customer care or what have you. So all of those pieces made it very difficult for them to be innovative. So I, I set about kind of replumbing the global media business, and and mm. uh, now Piano has about six hundred clients, and we're uh, in most, you know, we, we're in eighteen offices in fourteen countries around the world. So. Wow, I would, I definitely want to get into the expansion point and what it's been like to be a, a leader growing that business at some point. Yeah, you know, I'd love to, to start with some of the basics first, though. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, where the the kind of world is today, you know, I think there's been a you, know, you and I have both been in the digital business for a really long time. Uh, obviously, consumer behaviors have changed a lot. Can you give me a sense of of how people you feel are consuming media these days, and whether it's digital articles, videos, whatever, just just how people interact with this? Because I think that may help frame up a lot of like why, why this article economy um, exists. Sure, sure. And, and, you know, you really hit it on the head with this kind of article economy idea. You, you know, we, we all have this very, very prevalent behavior now of waiting for something or waking up in the morning. We're all clicking on links and reading articles. And when I speak at conferences, I say, you know, I have several first party cookies on every single device in this room. And I know that because everyone reads articles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do you make that behavior work out better for platform for publishers than for platforms, right? Mm -hmm. I think what has happened over the last several years, and part of this has been the rise of Donald Trump, part of it has been driven by COVID, but there's mm -hmm. been a real flight to quality in media where, you know, people I think didn't think that independent media had much of a life left, that it would be mm -hmm. like it would go the way of travel agents. And I remember mm -hmm. I had a conversation with some people at Medium who said, should newspapers really have their own website? They're not good at designing them. You know, we're really good at that. Uh, yeah. They don't know how to monetize it. They're not good at running it. It'd just be better if individuals bought directly from writers. And the, this idea that editorial organizations didn't have a place in the world seemed to me to be very, a very destructive idea mm -hmm. right? that, that there are some industries that should get disrupted, which is a euphemism for destroyed, but one <laughs> of them is not independent media, which, you know, has an incredibly valuable place in the world of, of yeah. reporting the truth. And so I'm incredibly proud of being a part of what I think has been a big shift towards reader supported mm -hmm. media. And, Number you know, I know there's a, a, a lot of, uh, obviously, a lot of distrust with media these days in the world. Um, and I wonder if that's maybe why the, the independent groups are becoming more successful. Maybe there's a, a less perceived, you know, actually, I, I, let me flip that into a question. Do you think there is a, uh, <laughs> a higher uh, perceived ability to influence the, you know, make maybe even partisan, you know, media when it's independent? Or do you think that they're more likely to to have you know unique opinions because they're maybe not part of a global conglomerate of media companies. I, you know, Freddie, I, I will tell you, I don't really exactly know what the question is, and I'm not sure to the extent you can disagree with the question whether I would agree with it. I, I think that there is real integrity on the part of most journalistic organizations. You know, yeah. we have a, we we work with some very left wing and some very right wing publications. Yeah. And, and we have as kind of the razor of who we'll work with, whether or not they're telling the truth, right? And, and it's awesome. e e even Love sites that. that I might disagree with, uh, you know, when we do our research and say, but are they reporting the truth? Even from a partisan perspective, we, we almost universally find that, that the answer is yes. So I, I, I think I that, that there is a lot of distrust of 
rightly so, there's a lot of distrust of platforms. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, the 230 needs to be reexamined because I think mm-hmm. it's, it's shameful that um, people put stuff out in the world that they then don't take responsibility for. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and you can sue the New York Times if they write something that you feel is is libelous, but you can't sue Twitter. And I, mm-hmm. I think that that there's there's something that needs to be fixed there. Right. Mm-hmm. There's something that needs to be. And, and, and just, uh, just to be clear. Right? Yeah. For 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 the audience out there. So platforms being any kind of the, the social media platforms, people that are not actually creating the content, but are helping distribute it. Publishers being people that actually create content. Is that accurate? Mm-hmm. That's yeah, exactly right. accurate. Yeah, so so I, so I think that there is a again has been a real flight to quality in 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 media, and that's a great thing. So, um, what do you think has changed the most for publishers over the last five years? Well, you know, to take that in a slight different direction, I, I you know, I I certainly think there's been a lot more emphasis on reader revenue, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, the New York Times. No one thought they'd get to a million subscribers once upon a time, and and now you know that then let alone ten million, right? And and they now want to be an indispensable subscription for in media consumption, right? And mm-hmm. and you witness their acquisition of everything from Wordle to the Athletic as as evidence mm-hmm. of that, right? Um, I, I think they and they have people used to say, well, the New York Times is different, but whether you're America's Test Kitchen or Digiday or TechCrunch or Mm -hmm. the Wall Street Journal or a variety of publications, if you have something that is of of unique demonstrable value, you can build a great subscription business out of it. And I think Mm -hmm. that is a very different view than we had five years ago when when Mm -hmm. people believe that, you know, there's this idea of subscription fatigue, which is sort of a nonsense idea. You know, the uh, back when people subscribed to magazines, if you subscribe to any magazine at all in the 1980s, the average number of magazines you subscribe to was eight. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of room, as we're seeing in connected television, there's a mm-hmm. lot of room for multiple subscriptions. And as those things add up, they're still largely cheaper than the consolidated mm-hmm. cable bill. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that reader revenue pie so much bigger is a is a very dramatic shift in mm-hmm. you know, I should say just subscriber revenue right for for, mm-hmm. for as well but but I do think that there's a lot of room yet for business model innovation fundamentally subscribing is a very expensive and high friction activity too much of the time and mm-hmm. the advertising model on the web is not great right mm-hmm. uh, it's you know nobody has ever shed a tear after viewing a banner ad so I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for, for innovation, both in the ad-supported model and e-commerce-supported models and in subscription and you know, paid models. Yeah, I think you've got a, a great point around, uh, subs- you know, around subscription fatigue. I think it's less about subscription fatigue as well. I think there's app fatigue. I do still believe in that. And I think that you know I've noticed uh, over time where I kind of said I would never subscribe to all these different things, but yet here I find myself kind of continuing to subscribe to, to more and more things and willing to pay for it because at the end of the day, it's a good value exchange. I feel I feel comfortable spending you know less than you know, uh, fifty cents a day for some of these things that I really enjoy. Um, but I do feel like you know there, you're starting to see. Um, uh, you know, I use the TV space as an example. Uh, I like how some of the apps now are, you're consolidating multiple subscriptions in one in one app. Um, so you're not getting the app fatigue, but you're but you're still you're still uh, bringing allowing people to get to these multiple subscriptions. Uh, do you have any opinion on on that in terms of a subscription model, or if you see any trends in in, in that direction? I, well, Freddie, first of all, I would say I, I'm sure myself and and the majority of your listeners don't make as much money as you do. So I think we probably struggle a little bit more than you to pay for all these additional Great. subscriptions. <laughs> Uh, but I only have, I already have like seven or eight. I'm not I'm not totally <laughs> like forty or fifty. <laughs> that, that said, I, I I do think there's tremendous value in a in a lot of these uh, subscriptions. I, I I um, you know the, the you bring up the question of bundling, and, and mm-hmm. there's lots of opportunity for bundling. Clearly, I mean the the you know subscribing to a printed publication is actually quite expensive for the 
publisher who's got to print a, a physical magazine or deliver a physical newspaper, very expensive proposition, whereas the gross margin on a digital product is much, much higher, right? So I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to lower the price point and expand the circulation through bundling. And I'm, I'm convinced mm -hmm. publishers are going to do that over time. Mm -hmm. um so uh, when you think of, you know, we've talked a little bit about around how we think uh, things have evolved over the last five years. Uh, there's uh, you know, some new new challenges kind of facing the, the publishing industry today, I'm assuming. What would you say are the, the biggest the biggest things that uh, publishers are are struggling to address today? Well, I think um, I think publishers are very. Um, you know, I'm very focused on their technology challenges, of course. And, and I think that they've had a lot of trouble historically understanding the reader. And I think they're scared um, based on the demise of the third party cookie that somehow that will get worse. I, I actually don't think it will. I think people will volunteer more data uh, than they have historically in order to kind of take control over their advertising preferences and other other mm -hmm. aspects of personalization. So I think as, as they start to now assemble the data, which used to be in a CRM system or CDP system, mm -hmm. that they get in an EMP thing they get in their web analytics tool, like from Piano or Google or Adobe, the, the, the transactional data, the data about the content mm -hmm. they're publishing, I think as that stuff starts to come together, they're forming closer and closer relationships with mm -hmm. the readers. And I, I think that has been hard for them. They, they've had real trouble with understanding and agility. And in a great way, you know, not only can they now, you know, avail themselves of what Piano has built, but we have more competitors than ever before. And I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, there's now choice there and opportunity and options in digital publishing that there didn't used to be. I think that the going outside of technology in answering your question, Freddie, yeah. I, you know, there is a there are demand on journalists than ever before to produce more with with less money, and I think mm. that's really really challenging. You know, the, mm. the number of journalists employed journalists in in the United States has dropped very precipitously and has not been healed by the you know expanding digital first publications. So I think it's, it's very, I think that's very difficult um, mm -hmm. because of the pressure that Google and Facebook have put on the advertising mm -hmm. industry, right? So. Uh, uh, out of interest, and uh, it's not a loaded question, uh, but do, do you have any idea if, uh, and it's maybe out of your core expertise, but any idea where those jobs are going? Is it shifting to like gig economy type stuff where they're, they're more like freelance writers or people literally leaving the industry? And I, I think people are leaving the industry. I mean, I think you're seeing wow. much smaller and, you know, the, the, the one could make an argument that there was some inefficiency built into a model where, you know, lots of different companies were writing the same story. Right. Mm -hmm. But but certainly, you know, there's a concept that um, that the Neiman Lab at Harvard has put forward of news deserts. I think it was them um, mm -hmm. of places where, you know, there's just less state house reporting and less local mm -hmm. government reporting. And that creates opportunity. Yeah. Anytime that suffers, that creates opportunity for corruption or, or confusion. I think you see a lot of that now. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, conspiracy theories that aren't drowned in truth, um, mm. which is a, it's an awful shame. So they're going, I don't necessarily think they're all going to the gig economy. But I certainly think Facebook are hiring with quite the that mm -hmm. one has to think maybe the smartest kids in class are no longer going and becoming, you know, New Yorker writers or New York Times writers. They're going to mm -hmm. um, crypto firms and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's it's super interesting. Hey, so um, speaking of crypto and things like that, you know, uh, Trevor, I've always thought of you as, as someone who's very, very tuned into technology and innovation. You've been you know, kind of always at the forefront of that. Thus, you know, things like piano being born. Um, are there any tech outside of what you guys are doing that you think is just kind of lights your fire a little bit right now? I know some of the things I'm, I'm thinking of, I'll probably chime in at some point, but I'd love to uh, see if there's any uh, new innovations in the industry that you think are, are, are worth noting. Well, I, I think that the idea of a distributed web is very interesting. 
I think we're a long way off from the time that the performance of that is is sufficient to really host production enterprise sites and applications on that kind of uh, network. But I certainly think conceptually, it, it's very interesting. That's sort of like a blockchain, blockchain and Ethereum based sort of web application capability. I, I think that that's super interesting. I, I'm, I tend to be more focused on you know, what technologies have existed for a while, but are now coming into their own. You know, we had video conferencing for a very long time before the pandemic, but it really we took off, I think, you know, uh, uh, more recently. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I'm very focused actually just on um, the, the quality of 5G and display technologies. I mean, just we are so capable now of delivering high bandwidth experiences into more places. Um, I think that's really exciting. I'm also, I know whether you've spent much time in virtual reality uh, mm. yet, Freddie, but but really interesting because unlike a web experience, which is which has this flatness to it, there's a physicality of virtual mm. reality that I didn't expect at all. All these, you know, games that are quite physical or things like Supernatural that are exercise programs mm -hmm. moving through space is really different than how one would think of the nerdy qualities of, of virtual reality. So I yeah. think virtual and augmented reality and space specific location uh, applications are really, really interesting. I, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm still, uh, you know, I feel like I'd still need more space to really enjoy VR the way I, I want to. I've, I've been even eyeballing one of those like stand in place treadmills, but I, I know I'm a dork, but I don't know if I'm ready to embrace that level of nerdiness just that yet. That is but... very, that is very dorky. <laughs> it's <is> perfect. <laughs> I can hang out with all my virtual friends there. I'll tell you too that I'm really nerded out right now, on right now. Uh, first off, I, you know, I, I had my kind of, uh, unfortunately failed run at, at joining the publishing and media world in my startup guide. And, you know, it, and we were trying to transform, you know, text-based news to, to, to video on the fly. One of the things that really made that not work was how bad text to speech was. It just never quite sounded right. And I checked out uh, a text to speech startup uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago. I was astounded by how good it was. I mean, honestly, I showed, I showed it to some folks and I was like, what do, you, what do you guys think of this? It's a new voiceover artist, you know, and, and not one person could figure out that it wasn't, wasn't human. Um, so, so I think something like that has some pretty big implications for, for the publishing world. And then the other one I'm, I'm uh, really geeked out on still is, um, you know, with uh, natural language processing and you know, machine learning people basically producing these effectively, you know, computer generated news articles. And I'd be interested to see, you know, I was watching that space quite closely three or four years ago, but I'd be interested to see if you're seeing more of that now where, you know, people are effectively replacing writers for kind of sports articles and more stock news articles, basically you know, computer generated articles. Are you, are you seeing any of that kind of hitting the mainstream? Well, yet? yeah, I mean, so robo journalism is, is, is increasingly common. Um, and, of course, it, it, we also, we're ingesting in natural language processing the articles themselves. So you wind up in a situation in which robots are writing articles and reading them. Uh, and, you know, we're sort of incidental to that entire process. Yeah. I, I, it, it, is, uh, it is spooky. And of course, you know, even newscasting can now be done with, you know, computer generated, you know, people that don't fully, that don't. I mean, that's, that's what I was trying to do. I was just nine years too early. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. For me. I mean, I think, you know, um, as I like to say about my own business, being early is the same as being wrong, right? Yeah, so, it's so, so true, so man. I mean, again, if we if, if I had the deep fake tech and this and this tech voiceover tech that I saw yesterday, I think it would actually have been a really yeah. viable idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Anyway. Um, yeah, but I mean, so, what, what, what you're, if I, if I may, what you're really saying, I think on some level is, we 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 create a bright line now in between video based media and text based media, and that will blur increasingly, right? Because to the extent a computer can create a video based on text, you know, or, and can create the text itself, it's it's a it's a it's a new world for content development. We we have Big a relationship time. with a company called AnyWord that does natural language optimization of marketing copy. And uh, it's really incredible to see uh, how effective it is and the, the new language that it comes up with. Unreal.
Let's, let's use this as a segue um, to talk a little bit more just about uh, you know, the business and uh, you know you as, as a, a leader. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, did you say you're on eight, 18 countries now? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 18 offices, 14 countries. 18 offices. Okay. Uh, and so how, how big's the, how big's the total headcount now? That's 660 people. That's amazing. I well done, mate. I had no idea it was up to that number. So hats off to you. And so, um, can you talk to me a little bit more around, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of focus in part, parts of your management style we could focus on. But I think uh, one of the things you know, I mentioned earlier is I find you to be a very inspiring leader. And I would love to understand as your company has continued to scale, especially on a global level, you know, how do you continue to get people to be as passionate about the company as, as you are? Well, I mean, uh, that's a that's a big, big topic. You know, my management... We got time. <laughs> so, so, you know, so first strategically, right? And then, you know, how do you set the vision and how do you set the strategy? I think that we're very fortunate in that, you know, we, we picked something early on where we really felt like we were helping. You know, as I said in the beginning of the show, independent media deserves great technology tools, right? It's important to help ensure the, the competency and survival of that as a sector. And so I think when we think at Piano about going into new markets, we tend to think about, okay, where is there an online activity where we can make it better for the company, better for the user, and kind of optimize that interaction? Most companies want very badly to better service customers. You give them more transparency and more agility, they, they'll improve the experience for, for the end user. So w start, starting with purpose was for us important. Um, secondly, I think we're quite uh, asymmetric or counter cyclical, right? If you look at a Lumascape chart of all the companies in marketing technology, there are literally thousands, right? And mm -hmm. in a case where they are all following the same playbook, it is therefore relatively impossible to succeed because, you know, you can only then differentiate yourself based on price, uh, which mm. is a, a not particularly successful. So what we not do good, is not a good one. <laughs> I, I tend to joke that the playbook in SaaS was always develop one thing, do it really, really well and sell it, you know, as small a slice as you can and sell it to as many companies as you can. And what we've done instead is to develop a big integrated suite, right, where we span a lot of functionality and sell it to a relatively limited number of customers in, in the media business, right? And that, that for us has been quite successful, but we never would have picked that had we been too doggedly following conventional wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. One thing we do, we, we publish an annual glossy magazine, right? People mm -hmm. thought we were bonkers when we started doing that, saying you're all about digital publishing and helping digital publishers and you're creating a print magazine. But <laughs> it, 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 if I send you 10 emails, Freddie, saying you should be working with piano, I'm stealing your time. If, on the other hand, I send you a magazine in the mail, I'm effectively giving you a gift. And so things mm -hmm. like that, there are, you know, everybody has been saying we're never coming back to offices. And we have been leaning more and more heavily on designing beautiful offices around the world because we think that environment is really critical for particularly for young talent right mm -hmm. so you know it, it's that kind of doing things a little bit differently particularly if they if we can err on the side of quality mm -hmm. really makes the staff feel differently about the brand mm -hmm. and about the company where they work and and really pays dividends so mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's been very important i have noticed that Nothing I ever say, right? If, if I have anything good to say to the staff, it will be misconstrued in one regard or another or quickly forgotten. And so I, I've, I've learned that repeating yourself and staying on message and just continually reinforcing the same ideas is really critical because, you know, you can lay out the strategy for staff and then a month later they say, yeah, but what are we doing here? Right. And so continuing to reiterate that is incredibly mm. important. And then mm. I'd say kind of leading by example, you know, to 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 be the kind of person you want to be. And to extend that into the organization 
it just requires a tremendous amount of work and commitment. And, mm. you know, when I am personally engaged with the teams and they see how engaged I am, they are more likely to behave similarly. I, 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 there's a concept that I like a lot, both in sales, but also in, in management that I call reciprocal effort, right? And Sorry, it, what was that? Reci reciprocal? Reciprocal effort. So, effort, you know, reciprocal Freddie, effort. Yes, yes, got yeah. it. So, Freddie, if I, if I were to write you a long note and you responded with a two-word response, you might feel a little guilty, right? <laughs> But 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 if I send you a two word note, a two word response would be appropriate, right? So yeah. you you are going to react to me with this an approximate level of care to which I interact with you, and so mm -hmm. I I take the staff and spend a lot of time crafting my communications to them and really think about it because I want them to be thoughtful in the same way in their work effort. If I if I didn't do that, if I was casual about it, it would kind of then invite the same level of casualness in. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's a really interesting theme kind of hidden inside of that as well around uh, consistency. I, I, I really um, appreciate, and I've personally experienced, you know, the you know, my own leadership roles. This sense of like, you know, it's easy, and if you tell them once, it's easy for one or two people in the group to maybe misinterpret something and go off on a on a on a tangent, and and those things can kind of spiral out of control. But this idea that you keep, you know, keep consistent with your message, uh, consistent with the way that you communicate, and, and you repeat these themes, so that over time those things get get kind of weeded away, uh, so that people really, um, you know, are very aligned around the bigger purpose and the bigger the bigger mission. So, um, I think that's um, really useful. Um, I, I want to go back to another thing you touched on a second ago. And uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, the kind of changing dynamics of remote versus in office and the fact that you guys are, st are still kind of investing in uh, or have been invested in historically in building some great experiences, especially as you, know, you kind of touched on maybe people um, earlier in their careers are, are far more, it may, may, it's, more, it's more impactful on them potentially to be surrounded by their peers and working together. Um, and I'd love to know, you know, are you have you evolved or tweaked that at, at all? Kind of expecting that that you know the dynamics may change over the next couple of years, or or you know what's what's the latest vision for you, basically? Yeah, well, I think the role of the office has changed, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think that there is no question in my mind that if you are trying to learn about how to interact in a, on a professional level, there is absolutely no substitute for being in an office environment with other people doing that. I think that is extraordinarily difficult to have that learning by osmosis and that serendipity that you get in an office. It just doesn't exist in Zoom. And I think Facebook's trying hard to create virtual reality environments and stuff like that in which that can take place. And we'll see how that works out. But but for now, you know, we, we, we had heard of remote work before, before the yeah. pandemic came. It's not like we didn't know it existed and we chose not to do so for, I think, some very good reasons. That being said, I think that the idea that, you know, I think there, there will be more hoteling. I mean, so we have now leased a, a retail space in Manhattan, right? And again, that, that's a bit counterintuitive, right? But m much as any SaaS company, like a Salesforce, will have an executive briefing center you know, or Snowflake will will do that. We're doing the exact same thing. We're inviting clients and prospects in to have events and to talk about things with us and look at the software in a kind of gallery showroom environment. But but we're just doing it on the ground floor so that we we're exposing it to more people. And and really, the power of retail space in Manhattan witnesseth the Apple Store and and things like it. There's just no substitute for that, right? So I'm I, I feel really great about that. All that being said, we will probably have about 50 people in New York at the time that that uh, store opens and they will mm -hmm. work at that office. But um, but there's only about half that many seats. And the reason is yeah. because so many people are traveling or working from home a given day or with clients mm -hmm. that, you know, really at any given moment, only about a third of the company will really be there. And so we've rethought about the space as much more about a collaborative environment. Mm -hmm than about individual desks that you'll sit at all day. 
And I, I think that mm-hmm. we'll see more and more of that, that the, mm-hmm. the architecture effectively, you know, um, mm-hmm. the, the kind of configuration of offices mm-hmm. will change. But, but you know, I, I sure hope they don't go away. I, I've, I've mm-hmm. loved my, uh, my life in the office. You, you, you know, uh, po- possible uh, was I think had th- thousands of employees, if I remember correctly, but that was still a merger of other companies. So there was a, yeah. a pre-existing businesses there. Uh, is Piano the the biggest business that you've helped kind of scale from the, from the ground up? Yes, although we've made acquisitions as well that have contributed. That's true. Okay, that's true. You have been acquisitions. Numbers, so I, I can't, I can't claim that it's uh, been one hundred percent. All, 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 all through, all through. Yeah, I understood. Where, yeah. where I was going with this was. Um, you know, I would like to just know after scaling this business over the last you know, number of years, what's the what's the biggest thing you've learned as a leader uh, from scaling a business, including through acquisition, um, you know, which could involve what you learned through acquisitions even. But I'd love to know what, what the biggest thing you've learned uh, helping build a business to the scale. Well, I, 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 I don't, I'm, 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 I'm I wish I were better, spot. <laughs> better prepared for that question. I, I think, you know, when, when we talk about scaling a business, right, yeah. what you're really scaling as the, as the CEO is you're really scaling a management team, right? That, that's the, when you talk about scale, adding more people to payroll is easy, right? That, that's not the hard part. The hard part is crafting a leadership group that can effectively manage the operations and growth of, of that business. And mm-hmm. so, I think you you need to understand from the very beginning that you've got a strategy where you understand whether you want everyone to stay on the wagon the entire time, mm-hmm. whether you're accepting that some people will fall off the sides, you'll know that you need to add new people to the mix. So I think being really aware that that people, you know, and great people, right? Don't necessarily, you know, the person who you bring on to be part of a $5 million business is not necessarily the person who should be performing exactly those same functions at a $100 million business. They might be, but they might mm-hmm. really be better at some subset of that and they need to be mm-hmm. augmented either underneath or, or on top. So I, I think I would say that I don't know whether it's like the biggest thing I've learned, but but I think the way to scale the business is to continually think about how you're scaling that team because that's effectively what you have control over. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've, I've been uh, obviously doing a ship for quite a few years now, and this is a question I like to ask people. And I've had some people focus in on you know the, the training and the onboarding, and the recruiting and the systems and the offices and all that. And you're actually one of the first people, if not the first person I've seen kind of directly address that if you if you build that crew around you, everything else will kind of fall into place. And I think that is uh, uh, crazy insightful. So um, I've got one last uh, question for you today and, and it's been a wonderful episode again. Thank you, Trevor, so much for joining us. Um, I would love to know if you, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, if you had any advice for any leaders or even new entrepreneurs that want to enter this industry, um, any, any advice or guidance you would, you would give them? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and before, before answering Freddie, let me just say, thanks again for having me on the show. Well, we, we can discuss another time why I was so far down on your list. <laughs> <laughs> I was practicing. I was practicing. To make my super, you're on the round of my big fish friends. I'm going to make sure I got yeah, the, this. The, the, this first, right. the first pancake is never the best. Um, so, so Freddie, <laughs> well I, I, I think I would say um, uh, uh, in terms of advice, when done correctly, right? The best part of work is the same thing as the best part of life. It's other people. And, you know, the, 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 the thing you can do best as a, as a person entering any business is proximity, you know, be close to and pay attention to and be useful to people whom you respect and enjoy. And, and that's, that's true, whether you're getting started or, or, you know, you, you've reached a ripe age as I have, right? It, it's really the more you can, can listen to and, and contribute to the experiences of the people around you, uh, the better off you'll be. I love it. I think that's uh, that's that's great, great advice and, and wise words uh, to live by. Um, so, Trevor, again, thank you for your time today. I want to thank everyone in the audience who's 
tuned in, whether you're tuning in live uh, through any of the current live streams they're running, or you are listening and watching to the show, post show on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, or any of the, or any of our audio podcasts, whether you're on Apple and Google and Spotify, thank you very much for watching. Uh, the best thing you can do to continue to support the show, besides tuning in every week, is tell your friends, give us a like, subscribe, thumbs up, whatever you want to do. Uh, we really appreciate it. We we enjoy doing this show every week, and and we love that you tune every week uh, as well. So, uh, Trevor, uh, thanks again. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Trevor, best places to find him are on uh, his LinkedIn or check out uh, piano.io uh, and, uh, and and check out the business. It's a very, very uh, interesting company. So uh, any final words, Trevor? No, other than thanks again, and, and thank you for watching. Awesome. Don't go anywhere. Thanks again, everyone, for watching our ship. Mm -hmm.